Well, if you are one of those people whose veterinarian sends you those cards in the mail every year that your pet is due for their annual vaccines, then you definitely want to stick around and hear what we have to talk about today. My brain was not working for a second. But anyway, so you definitely want to stick around and hear what we have to talk about today because we're talking about protecting your pet from vaccine damage. And we are absolutely going to be taking questions today, but I want to first get into one, why we're talking about this, and two, what to look for, and three, maybe I shouldn't have numbered these, three, what you can do, right, to help protect your pet. So you get one of those cards in the mail, and it says your pet is due for a vaccine. Hmm. Well, I know we've talked about this on the podcast many times. We also talked about it on the Pet Health Junkies podcast. Thank you all so much for joining me today. By the way, um, we have Facebook and Instagram going, but so here's the thing, the vaccine, having your pet immunized for potentially very, very dangerous, even deadly viruses and diseases, it's important, right? We don't want to overlook, we don't want to overlook that fact. We do want immunization, especially from something as deadly and dangerous as rabies, which is why um, uh, I think all of our states, 50 states, have rabies laws in place saying that you have to vaccinate your pet against rabies. Now, here's one thing that we can start this conversation off with. There's a difference between vaccination and immunization. That's the first thing. Now, these laws are for vaccination, but it is important <laughs> to know my, <laughs> we just got a package. <laughs> um, oh my gracious. He wants, of course, they're gonna wanna, they want a signature and my husband isn't around. Sorry guys, let me, hang on one second. This isn't going as planned now, is it? <laughs> um, the joy of live video. So I got a package that I had to sign for. Sorry about that. But we are talking about um, the difference in vaccination and immunization. Now, our rabies laws are for vaccination. But just because you have vaccinated for something doesn't mean that immunization has occurred. There is a difference. What is the difference? The difference is vaccination means that that needle punctured the skin and whatever you're vaccinated against, that substance was injected into that animal or human. That's vaccination. Immunization is what uh, the, the process that the body goes through to take that vaccine and actually the immune system produce antibodies and uh, memory cells along with those antibodies to uh, create a defense to learn what that virus or disease is and to create immunization against it so that the body knows, oh, I know what this is, and now I know how to attack it and protect against it. So that, there is a difference, right? Unfortunately, and this is where I think our laws are lacking, I think our laws, me personally, this is my personal opinion, that our laws should be for immunization not necessarily vaccination, but alas, I am one person. Though I do think there are plenty of other people like me who think that we should amend these laws for immunization and not just vaccination. Um, so that is one thing 
to know. That's one thing we should know about. Now, I will give you a heads up that April, early April, I want to say maybe April 12th, um, there is a Pet Health Junkies pot podcast that is going live with Dr. Lori Kozier, and we are talking about all the things about vaccines. So this is kind of a primer for um, talking talking a little bit about vaccines. So most conventional, many conventional veterinarians are of the opinion that uh, adverse vaccine reactions in pets, no matter their severity, are for some reason worth the risk. I don't necessarily agree. I think that, um, and, and, and as you will hear in the podcast coming up with Dr. Kozier, there is an altered vaccine schedule that she has available at Healthy Dog Workshop, which is generally um, the vaccine schedule that I recommend to people when people do reach out to me. Like if you were to DM me right now and say, hey, I am, you know, I know that I want to be as proactive as I can. And I just got this new pet and I want to make sure that I am doing everything I can to keep them as healthy as I can, but also know that we do need to get the puppy vaccines or the kitten vaccines, whatever that may be. The Healthy Dog Workshop um, vaccine protocol is generally what I send them to, though I will give you a heads up. I am going to um, put together a digital download for you guys um, that kind of combines the best of Dr. Ruth Roberts and Dr. Lori Kozier's information into one uh, streamlined PDF for both dogs and cats. Because that's one thing that I have not seen a lot of is like putting it together. Here's what you need to know all in one place for both your dogs and your cats. So I'm going to do that for you guys. Um, and if you have interest in that, you can DM me or comment uh, depending on where you're watching this. Hello, hello. But here's here's the thing. Um, vaccinosis. And I have talked about vaccinosis on the uh, pet parenting reset in the past. So definitely if you haven't already subscribed to that podcast on your podcast app, or you can even watch those videos on YouTube if you prefer to to do that. A lot of times I will pull something up on YouTube and just have it playing in the background like it is a podcast. So that's kind of how um, I like to use YouTube most of the time. <laughs> and you can do that if you prefer to do that. It's also on Rumble, but whatever podcast app you're using, I have talked about vaccinosis before. And um, I think this is a very, very, very important topic because most people are not talking about it. So Again, we're talking about what we can do to help our pets in the event they do need to get vaccines, because of course we do at some point, and then there are the rabies laws, but when they are kittens, when they are puppies, there is a set of vaccines that are required to give. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and, and I also have a, a couple of stories um, of why I decided to choose this topic today. So. Uh, before we get into what are some of the things to look for in vaccinosis and what that is, there, there were two, two things uh, going on recently, th well, three really, that uh, made me want to talk to you about this today. So the first one is that this past weekend, I was at a live event, myself and uh, Pam Roussel, uh, we shared a, a table at, up at Pupology, which is our local healthy, ow, I hurt myself. Um, our local healthy pet food store. And we just, people were coming and we were talking and giving free advice and doing all the things and, you know, just um, uh, being present in our local community, which is awesome. And a lady came up talking about her dog and how their behavior has radically changed towards other dogs and uh, even in her home. And so um, I was initially talking to her about reintroduction and training and Pam jumped in and said, what happened around that time that your dog's behavior started changing? And so we kind of looked into that a little bit and sure enough, that dog was uh, revaccinated for rabies. 
And Pam said, that sounds exactly like a rabies miasm. So she actually went home that day and wrote a blog on Perfectly Holistic. So her blog is very cat centric. So it is um, her blog, this particular blog on the rabies vaccine miasm is geared towards cats. But basically uh, what she's saying, what is a miasm? What does a miasm look like? And uh, DM me and I will send you a link to this blog. Mental, emotional, and physical changes can begin within hours or days, up to weeks or months. This is this is where a lot of traditional veterinarians have a really hard time because, and, and even Dr. Will Falconer, who is a homeopath and holistic veterinarian, will say it can be 30 days from the uh, vaccination date, especially when we're talking about dogs that get these like really itchy skin and um, aller food sensitivities and allergies start to pop up, 30 days past a vaccination date. And that is still, that is vaccinosis. That, But anyway, mental, emotional, and physical changes can begin within hours or even days up to weeks or months following a rabies vaccine. Therefore, it's super important to pay careful attention to your cat's overall state of being or your dog's overall state of being from the moment the vaccine is given, like the very moment. Furthermore, keep a written journal and be sure to record dates, vet appointments, any vaccines given, behavior, any changes in behavior whatsoever, appetite, and anything that seems off to you, anything that seems different. Symptoms of the rabies miasm that uh, she has come across <clears throat> in her cases are aggression and anger, especially if this is uncharacteristic of your pet, uh, hoarseness, loss of voice, anxiety, and fearful behavior that wasn't present prior to receiving the rabies vaccine, a desire to escape, roam, or wander off, uh, pica, which is a desire to eat non-food items like sticks, wood, textiles, rocks, plastic, poop, etc., uh, suspicious and fearful of strangers or new pets. That's a big one. Uh, seizures, twitches, and symptoms of feline hyperestensia syndrome. There's, I'm sure, something similar in dogs, but seizures and twitches. Uh, sudden lameness, ataxia, fear of water, uh, even rain, refusing to drink water, doesn't like being left alone, separation anxiety, and reverse sneezing. So here's what basically, and in, in my mind, what I boil this down to is you're actually seeing the symptoms of what you would think of uh, an animal who has rabies, like their behavior. And you're seeing that as a result of giving the rabies vaccine to this dog or cat. And that is what a, that is known as a miasm. So, um, I actually pulled up a blog post from Dr. Karen Becker, who wrote about vaccinosis and what are some of the things to look for in vaccinosis, and uh, which are adverse vaccine reactions. This is not specific to rabies. This could be any vaccine. Um, so the more mild ones are discomfort, swelling at locally at the vaccination site, uh, mild fever, decreased appetite and activity, sneezing, mild coughing, or a snotty nose, um, maybe other respiratory signs within a few days if it's an intranasal vaccine, which happens with uh, more commonly with dogs. So um, less common but more serious vaccinosis symptoms, persistent vomiting or diarrhea, itchy skin that may seem bumpy like hives, swelling of the muzzle and around the face, neck, or eyes, severe coughing or difficulty breathing, and even collapse. So that is definitely more serious. Um, also, and I have found this to be true even in pets that I have come into contact with or pets that I have owned, um, sometimes you can get like a, a bump that will occur at the injection site. And a lot of times I have noticed that these can turn uh, cancerous. So that is something to definitely, definitely look for. Um, so yes, vaccinosis is a real thing and it is something that we need to be very aware of and understand. 
Um, so what can we do? Um, or actually, let me finish this list of, uh, so common symptoms of vaccinosis, lethargy, hair loss, hair color change at the injection site, um, fever, soreness, stiffness, lack of appetite, conjunctivitis, sneezing, and oral ulcers are all very common signs of vaccinosis. Very serious symptoms of vaccinosis include immunosuppression, behavioral changes, vitiligo, weight loss, um, reduced milk production in females, lameness, granuloma, granulomas, and abscesses, hives, facial swelling, allergic hypersensitivity, respiratory disease, and uh, allergic uveitis. And then the most severe symptoms of axinosis are injection site sarcomas, which I was just telling you about, that, that's cancer. Anaphylaxis, very, very, very acutely serious. Um, autoimmune arthritis, polyarthritis, hypertrophic um, osteodystrophy, immune hemolytic anemia, immune mediated thrombocytopenia, thyroiditis, um, myocarditis, encephalitis, or polyneuritis, seizures, abortion, congenital abnormalities, embryotic or fetal death, and infertility. So that's a lot, right? That's a lot of stuff that we know potentially um, are possible side effects. So the very first thing we can do, what, what can we do? The very first thing is knowing um, and, and adhering to a vaccine protocol that you are comfortable with for your pet. Um, hello, hello, thank you so much for joining, that you're comfortable with for your pet. And for me, again, getting those core vaccines in a puppy or a kitten um, is important, I do think. However, I, I, I also think that they need to be altered or adjusted a little bit, meaning um, starting a little bit later, because we know that oftentimes when we, when we try to vaccinate an animal too early in life, when they're too young um, and their system is still being controlled, their immune system is still being controlled by their, um, uh, the immunity that they have left over from their mother from being born, uh, that can supersede uh, vaccination. So you get all of the risk, but none of the benefit, basically, when you uh, vaccinate too young. So starting at around uh, 12, 14, 16 weeks, depending on how comfortable you are and which schedule you're looking at. Um, as I said earlier, I'm going to put together a PDF and kind of combine um, all of the wisdom from the veterinarians that I, I follow and um, have taught me, put it all in one PDF, PDF for you guys. So DM me um, at any point if you want me to send that to you and I'll put you on, on my waiting list for that. And um, so getting those core vaccines is important, getting them in not too young, but still when they are younger, and then also not doing everything all at once. So ideally we wanna space these initial puppy or kitten vaccines out. You know, you get one, wait two weeks, you can get another one, wait another two weeks, which also means that we don't wanna do these combo vaccines. Now, why is it important to space them out and to not do the combos? Primarily because if your pet does have a reaction, then we need to know which vaccine they had the reaction to. So. For instance, I had a cat who, uh, as a kitten, I took her and her litter mate in to have them vaccinated. And this was many, many years ago. And uh, she had a vaccine reaction and she was incredibly lethargic. Uh, I could barely get her to wake up that evening. She was very hot. She had a fever. She had a, you know, a high temperature. Um, and didn't want to eat or drink, of course. She was so lethargic, I, I could barely wake her up. It was scary. It was really, really scary. Now, we did not know which vaccine did that to her because she got multiple vaccines all in one day, right? So 
the veterinarian made the assumption that it was the rabies vaccine based on her knowledge of, you know, seeing prior animals with these reactions and said, we're fortunately, because this was before I knew anything about anything. This was so long ago. Um, she said, we will never want to give the rabies vaccine to this cat again. And this happened to be a cat that I was fostering. Uh, I, when I adopted her out, that was a stipulation. The person who adopted her knew, and it was on her paperwork to never give her a rabies vaccine because she had um, a, a pretty serious reaction to it. In my opinion, it was serious. It was very <laughs> devastating for me. It was shocking and like, oh my gosh, is my baby going to be okay? Um, because she was so lethargic and she had such a high fever. But um, we knew, okay, and, and we, we did make the assumption that it was the rabies and the, the adopter, I actually followed up with her later on in life. Um, and she told me that they never, never did give her another rabies vaccination because of that. And she never had any other issues, which was wonderful, like to know, but these things happen. And so, and fortunately the assumption that the veterinarian at the time made was accurate, that it was a rabies vaccine, but really we didn't know because she got multiple all at once right so um why i like to monitor tnr and feral cats for for yeah absolutely and it is important and i know i i wish when i was doing tnr many 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 lifetimes ago um i wish i had known all of this too because that wasn't our practice um to, to monitor them for 48 hours but i'm thankful that you are, thank you. And that's the Cowboy Cat Wrangler joining us. Um, thankful that you are doing that for your TNR cats because it is important and we do need to know um, what's what's going on, what's happening. Now, later in life, later in life, we can look and see, okay, we've already given such and such vaccinations. And one really, really great thing about getting those puppy and kitten vaccinations is that we can do titer testing, which is a simple blood test to see if antibodies were produced to create immunity in the body. And so we can actually test and see, did that vaccine work? Does this animal have immunity? And that's what I do with my dog. I haven't had to do it with my cats, fortunately, because the, my veterinarian understands they had multiple, because I didn't know any better, they've had multiple vaccines in their lives. They're good, my vet's good. They're like, we don't need to titer them, we're good. I am fortunate in that regard, I know that, um, but I do, I did titer my dog because my uh, veterinarian did wanna know for sure. I'm like, yep, that sounds great. Let's find out for sure. We did a simple blood draw. We sent it off and got back the report showing that she, in fact, did create immune response to we did. Um, I did rabies, parvo and distemper, did, did all three. And she did, does, in fact, have an immune response. So that to my veterinarian is sufficient that we don't need we don't need to keep injecting these vaccines into her. Um, and that is important because there are always, and I don't care what you are using, what, you know, vaccine, what pharmaceutical product, whatever it is. Yeah, there is a reason you're using it and a benefit to it. There are also risks and side effects. And in some instances, and this is your choice, your decision to make for your pet, for me, a lot of times those risks outweigh the benefit, especially when I know in, in a situation like a vaccine, I can I can actually test and see that immunity is is already existing. So I don't need to risk all of the side effects in continuing to vaccinate when immunity is already there. Does that I hope that makes sense. <laughs> but um, even some of us who are like, well, okay, I'm now thinking back to my pet started, their behavior changed, or they got really, really itchy, 
right? They were scratching all the time or um, they developed food sensitivities and they're think you're thinking back and you're like, oh my goodness, maybe it was like within a couple of weeks or right after they got vaccinations. Well, what can you do, right? There are things that you can do. And one of those things is uh, doing a detox. Now, I am not here to tell you how to or when to detox your animal that I personally feel that this is a very individualized thing. Like I don't ever want to say like every animal needs this done every single, you know, whatever time of the, of the year, like if you're doing a vaccine or if um, some people will just detox, you know, seasonally, like, yeah, that can be a, a benefit for your pet individually, but I am not absolutely not. I would never tell you um, to do something with your pet without knowing more specifics about your animal. Um, so this is very individualized, but just to give you an idea, um, most vaccines can be detox with Thuya. Um, and that is easily accessible over the counter. Um, however, rabies is a little bit different and Thuya doesn't necessarily work for detoxing the rabies vaccine. Most um, of the holistic veterinarians that I have talked to and consulted with and asked about, um, also what I, what I learned personally in my certificate, my holistic health um, coaching certification was to use uh, Thuya for um, all of the vaccines except for rabies and rabies, uh, you use Listen, which is a homeopathy. Listen 30C is what it's called. So um, doing a detox, but uh, you know, as you will hear, um, when we talked to Dr. Lori Kozier on Pet Health Junkies, which again, I believe is going live April 12th. So make sure if you're not following the Pet Health Junkies podcast, you go ahead and give that a follow. So it will pop up in your library when that episode becomes available. Um, she is a proponent for not doing a whole lot of detoxing, um, but instead keeping the animal really, really healthy to begin with, feeding a species appropriate diet, um, a balanced diet, and, and not necessarily balancing every meal, but at least balancing over time, um, adequate levels of exercise. So many animals aren't getting enough exercise and enrichment to work their brain um, and not giving, again, not over vaccinating, um, vaccinating what you need to vaccinate for and then testing. Um, but not over vaccinating, not putting all the chemicals on your pets. So the, you know, neurotoxins that we call flea and tick medicines and different things that we use around the house, keeping our home environment really clean and uh, free of chemicals and carcinogens. That is, um, you know, she's just a big proponent. Of course, I am too, but that's her preferred method of quote unquote detoxing, right? Because if we're healthy enough, the body is naturally gonna do what it needs to do. Um, I would, you know, as, as so Dr. Kozier is also a breeder of dogs. So her dogs, fortunately um, that she breeds, you know, she knows how healthy the mother is. Uh, for an animal that, you know, you're adopting a puppy or a kitten, you don't know how healthy their mother was. Um, so, it's hard to say, like, are they even starting off on the right foot? Yeah, we might need to give them a little extra support because we don't know that their mother was healthy, right, um, to begin with. So if the mother wasn't healthy, then the, the, the offspring are not going to be super healthy from the get-go. So there's a lot to think about going into it, but supporting the body, even something as simple as, um, like I said, Thuya for uh, the, the majority of, uh, but again, like I said, individualized. I I am a big proponent for um, not giving you uh, you know check boxes that apply to every animal because I don't think that's the case. I think every animal is, is an individual, and individualizing their care is very very important to me. So um, that is just 
some of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about today. And I hope that that was clear and concise and you understand if you have any questions about what vaccinosis is or um, why we need to be aware of it and why we need to, I think, it, I, I just think it's really important that we keep this conversation going um, so that more and more people can hear and understand that, you know, big box medicine is not, um, not ideal, right? So reactive medicine is not ideal. We don't want, we don't want it, right? We don't want to walk into a doctor's office and they check a few boxes and don't even look up at you and say, you're overweight and you need this supplement and you need that supplement. And I'm going to put you, or not even supplements, you need this drug and you need this drug and I'm going to write you four prescriptions and see you in six months or a year, whatever it is. Like they don't even look at you. Like that's not the kind of care that we want. That's not the kind of care we want for our pets. We want individualized care, which doesn't, doesn't work with our current system, right? We have a very reactive medical system, both for humans and for animals. And we want to be more proactive to keep ourselves and our pets healthy from the get-go. So we don't have to rely on reactive medicine more than we absolutely have to. So with that, you guys have been great today. Thank you so much for joining in and talking about letting me know about um, monitoring your TNR feral cats. That's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that you're doing that. Thank you so much for everything you're doing for our feral cats. They have certainly a special place in my heart. So with that, I am going to go ahead and end today's video. Thank you so much. I went a little over our 30 minutes. I apologize, but I had so much to say. You guys are awesome. You're wonderful. I will definitely see you next Thursday. If you have any requests for topics, um, questions that you want answered, let me know, comment, um, or send me a DM, and uh, we can we can work that in to one of these live sessions. Y'all have a wonderful weekend coming up and give your pets some extra love from me until next week. Bye guys.